Good morning. Let us pray. Oh God, because without you we are not able to please you, mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Today we have two readings, the first from Romans. St. Paul said, Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. And of those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. While those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to the Lord. And now, the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if a member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with the slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him, and as he could not pay, his lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then the fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused then. He went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then the Lord summoned him and said, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Good morning, friends. Today we start with one of the hardest teachings of Jesus. Matthew puts it this way. Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. Now in the Jewish mind, forgiveness took a few things. Number one, recognition that a wrong had been committed. Number two, a ceasing of the sin or transgression and to make a promise to never do it again. And three, to ask for forgiveness. And it should be sincerely given up to three times. The bigger the sin, the more the need for forgiveness. Three times for something really bad. So what does Peter do? He doubles the expectation and adds one just to be safe. He wanted to look good in front of Jesus. I'll see your three and then raise you four more. Ha! Ah. But then Jesus gets into the complicated math. 
The New Revised Standard Version translation, the one we read from, says 77, while most translators say 70 times 7. Either way, there's a lot of forgiving going on. Forgiving without end, math, either way, that most who heard could not even imagine. 70 times 7? Now, this is elementary math to most of us, but the staggering sum of 490 would have probably been incalculable to most who were there. It's like saying a gazillion or some other nonsense number word. Jesus is saying that we keep on forgiving, and because we had received it, we are to be on the giving side of forgiving too. We pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Or better yet, in more modern translations, forgive us our debts and or our sins as we forgive those who owe us or those who sin against us. Matthew uses the same word for both debt and for sin. Pay attention to that. The nature of forgiveness is the root of our sermon today. It's about receiving it and giving it. Then and only then can we have grace-filled lives. Jesus tells the story of one who was ingracious, who received grace beyond measure and could not extend a cup of the same to someone else. The actions of the forgiven servant cannot be more ingracious, unmerciful, or hypocritical. Friends, we are to give to others as we have received. Forgiveness means letting go of something. And that's why Jesus is so adamant about forgiving a gazillion times. He knows in each of us there's a little troll that hoards on those grudges. We hold on to it. It comes out in strange ways and at strange times. And we have to once again forgive. We have to let it go. Father Richard Rohr said, Forgiveness is to let go of our hope for a different past. Forgiveness is, our, is to let go of our hope for a different past. Our hope for a different past could be that it never happened, but it did. Forgiveness is not pretending that it didn't happen. Forgiveness cannot change the story that has passed. Forgiveness is rewriting the story of the future. That is where we have the power to create and change. What's done is done. What will be can be influenced by us, our choices and responses, and ultimately God's grace. Again, think on St. Paul, no greater sinner as a persecutor of the church, as he put it, and yet called in his sinfulness, redeemed by God's grace, reformed through the Spirit, and sent by Christ himself to take the faith that found him and saved him to a hurting and broken world. If God can do that for St. Paul, then God can do anything. When we are wronged, not if, when, there is nothing we can do to change what happened. The only power we have, the only choice in the situation, is to forgive. If we wait for anything else to make it happen, it won't. We have to be the bigger person, the grace-filled and grace-giving person who will offer and live into forgiveness. Often it's not fun. It might make us look naive or a fool, so be it. We are to forgive because God forgives, just as we are to love because God loves us. He models for us what is right and proper in God's will. Paul talked about that in our Romans passage. There are some maturing grace, and if that's true, then they are also mature in forgiving. We all make the best decisions we have with what we've got, and the intention of the heart is the heart of the matter. The right thing in one context might be anathema in another. When we pray or say the national, sing the national anthem, we ask people to take their hats off. But in the Jewish tradition, the way you show respect was to cover your head when you prayed, to show your humility. Opposite actions trying to reach the same outcome, kneeling or standing to pray. Opposite actions, but both set apart prayer by doing something out of the ordinary to set it apart. In Paul's writing in Romans, he looked at those who chose to be vegetarian and those who chose to eat meat. He argued that the action was not the thing, but the intention of the heart. I've seen a lot of arguments in the church during my short life. Should women be in ministry? Should there be gay bishops? What about LGBTQ plus participation? And now trans rights seems to be the thing everybody worries about. Every time one of these weapons of mass distraction comes up, 
I have to remind myself of Paul's words. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to me. So then each of us will be accountable to God. Often, too often, these issues that have been raised up are only there to get people's ire up. And if people can get their ire up, they can get angry. And if they can be angry, they can be controlled. I'd rather keep my focus on God and God's way of doing things. And even then, I cannot judge too harshly my judgy fellow Christians, for then I'm just as bad as them. I'm not called to judge, but I am called to discern and ask what God is asking of me. I can remind myself of the words of the prophet Isaiah. See, I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert, says God. Now what seems impossible for us is possible with God. It says that repeatedly uh, through the scriptures. God can make water where there is none. God can make things that we cannot fathom be real. God can put forgiveness and change in our hearts when we are hardened and unforgiving. Thanks be to God. Now, you probably have heard some of the story that led me and my wife into the Episcopal Church. There was a guy who made it his mission to get me gone out of the ministry. And I'll never know for sure why, but I have my guesses. Whatever the reason, he did what he could to make sure I was not only fired, but he also was there to bespudge my character so that I would never work in a church again. He was a fellow pastor, and I trusted him. Long story short, he didn't win, but the damage done meant that neither could I stay where I was. Mine was a Pyrrhic victory. And I had a lot of questions about polity, power, and protocol that, happened, that allowed that situation to happen. But more importantly, this was a guy that life in Richmond meant that I would keep bumping into for years to come, repeatedly. I remember the first time I slunk away, not wanting a confrontation, and just still hurting. But the second and third time, it got a little better, but it was still the same. But as the years went on, it came that he avoided me. When I would see him, he would not make eye contact with me. In the years since, I've come to pray for him and his healing. Forgiveness took a long time, not three times, not seven times, probably 77 times or more. Forgiveness was letting go of the story I had written that he had derailed. Forgiveness was letting go of the pain that I felt. Hating him did nothing except feed my pain. Forgiveness meant seeing him as a flawed sinner, just as I am and was, and as each and every one of us is. We are flawed sinners that can be saved by grace if we let it. God may give me a chance to bump into him one day, and I hope I can finally honestly look him in the eye and say, I forgive you. God can make all things new, even our mess ups, even our sins, even our broken relationships. Every single thing can be redeemed by God's grace. God's desire is all to come to God and is breaking down those barriers and walls that we build to keep that from happening. If God's intent is for us to live in graciousness, love, and forgiveness, how can we get in anyone's way to the path? In Jesus' parable, the ungracious servant is the one who is condemned. Let that stay with you. When we withhold forgiveness, when we keep up, keep up barriers and parameters that are about our comfort, not someone else's safety, when we are not like Christ who forgave sinners and welcomed them into paradise, even on the cross, are we like Christ or are we like the ungracious servant in the parable? Think about it this way. If we err on the side of being too gracious, God has to forgive us because we're only trying to be like God. Amen. God bless you today. And we hope to see you soon. Amen.